Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to the inaugural lecture of the Step Centre Annual Summer School, uh, which uh, everyone is uh, really great to see so many folk here. We've got 40 students for the next two weeks from uh, 20 to 30 countries around the world who uh, we're really pleased to have here. We've had a great day uh, already getting quite rumbustious in the discussions. Uh, so welcome and welcome to everyone else for our inaugural speaker, which we are hugely uh, grateful, Harriet, for you coming down here. Harriet has been a uh, colleague uh, working on very similar issues to those of the Step Centre, going back for me in many years, I should say a number of years, <laughs> many years uh, time. <laughs> prior to the Step Centre being set up on, on, on this sort of really tricky juncture between really taking the environment seriously but recognising that we need to be critical about those kinds of perspectives. And the work you've done on waste and on urban transformations and energy transitions have all been really for us exemplary of that. Although we take different views on some of the things, I think your work has been really inspiring for us here. So thank you for coming down. Really look forward to the discussion. 45 minutes or so, followed by 45 minutes discussion, and then some vital sustenance. <laughs> okay. So, Harriet, welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks very much for inviting me here today. So, uh, it's, it's really delightful to be here and to see some uh, old colleagues here, and but also to see very many new faces and from very many different parts of the world. And what I wanted to try to do today is, is take this particular moment in climate governance, we all know that we've recently had the Paris um, meeting, the COP21, and for some people that has been something of a turning point in the climate change discussions. And I wanted to kind of use that to think about, okay, well now, can we govern the climate? Um, we could just answer that quite simply, no we can't, we could all go home or go to important football matches or have that sustenance as we promised, uh, but we will, we will explore this question for a little bit longer, uh, for 40 minutes, then maybe it's a rather straightforward answer. One of the interesting things for me, now that I teach, in a, I teach a, a second year course in Durham on uh, climate change with physical geography colleagues, and when we were designing the course a couple of years ago, we realised that almost everybody in our class, because they are, uh, we don't have very many mature students in the university in our degree programme, has lived their entire lives while we've been trying to govern the climate. Because we've been trying to govern the climate in this way since, well, we could say 1991. None of my students in my class this year have been born before then. So they have only ever lived in a world where we've been trying to govern the climate. So, in a sense, you could think that we haven't got very far. And in this case, well, where, where do we go now? If we've tried for almost a quarter of a century to be governing the climate and lived entirely in a world for some people in which that has been the case. Does this mean that there's nowhere to go to? And uh, here, one of my favorite uh, bits of Alice in Wonderland, I have quite a few favorite bits of Alice in Wonderland, because when you are involved in climate change, it does sometimes feel like you have entered a very strange world in which lots of things are upside down and people are doing ridiculous, crazy things that they wouldn't do in the normal world, uh, where we knew that there was a climate change emergency. But as uh, the Cheshire Cat tells Alice, well, you know, there is always somewhere to go to, it just rather depends on where you want to get to next. So it's not that there is nowhere to go, it's not that we have reached the end of the road, but rather that we must decide again where we want to go to when we're going in climate change. And I want to make some arguments about where that road might take us and why, from my perspective, we need to start from a different conceptual perspective in order to work out which is the road best to travel. But before that, and in this kind of recognition that we have been governing the climate for quite so much time, I thought we should go back to the future to just remember what it was like when we started to try to govern the climate, just in case some of you weren't around. <laughs> it was the 1980s. It was. That was what the 1980s was like. People did uh, that kind of exercise with leg warmers on. We had, uh, we had a CD, the first uh, CD. Now that's what I call music four. I was trying to explain to my children who like, now that's what I call music 96 or whatever it is now. That, you know, but number four was around when I was uh, in the 1980s. We had mixtapes, Gary Lineker, look at him. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so this was the 1980s, but very importantly, in the 1980s, we didn't have things like the World Wide Web. Google didn't know everything, and people actually had to meet each other to negotiate things and decide stuff. And the amount of science and knowledge 
and interconnectivity that we had to negotiate and understand the world was very much more difficult. So this is when climate change negotiations started. And at that time, this was the problem that we thought climate change was about. We thought that climate change was about how do we create a collective response to a common property problem. We have one atmosphere, we're all using it, we're all using it in different ways it turns out. Some of us are using it rather a lot more than others. Uh, and how do we create common but differentiated responsibilities to manage the commons? And climate governance for the last 25 years has been based upon, upon that idea of governing the commons and how do we achieve that. And the argument that I'm going to be wanting to make with you today is that framing the climate problem in that way is actually what means that we can't govern it. That may be slightly controversial, I won't get into whether this is an either or game, probably it's not actually either or, but for the sake of an argument and a discussion today I will make that one. So if we think about climate change as a collective action problem that needs <coughs> common governance, then this is what it means to govern the climate. It means one summit after another, I quite like that cartoon of um, going from Copenhagen to the next summit. It means these kind of scenes that we're all very familiar with on our televisions at the end of the, of the COP meetings of exhausted delegates or arguments around the table. And it means an idea that we fail to govern the climate. So it means both a sort of always a renewal of the hope that we can get to the next summit, that once we reach the top of that peak, we will be able to govern the climate, but it also always means that we're disappointed. We both try to reach a peak, and it's like a hill that you can't climb. You, get, you can see the top, you think you can see the summit, but you don't ever quite get there. So in a sense, this is what it means to govern the climate when we think of it as a collective action problem. But it has been how it has been orchestrated, if you like. These are the different ways, if you like, or, or a very rough caricature of the way in which we try to solve the climate commons problem. We've had an international regime, an architecture, if you like, of different uh, agreements, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Kyoto Protocol, that act as a kind of central hub which radiates out the way in which we should govern the climate. It's fed into by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a science policy interface which gives the basis for certainty that we are sure that we should be governing the climate in particular ways. And other actors, NGOs and business groups, try to lobby and manoeuvre the core kind of architecture, if you like, in order to create the kind of climate agreement that they think we should have. You then effectively get mechanisms or instruments and finance trickling down from the international to the national to the local. So if you like, it's a, a very hierarchical model of how climate governance works, but it is what dominated the 1990s and how we developed our climate architecture to start with, or in a sense, what we're seeing now is perhaps that this is being disrupted. <coughs> so one of my arguments I want to make with you here and now is that what, why, why we think of Paris as a turning point is because that has, in a sense, been inverted. It's taken some time to invert that kind of hierarchical model, but what we saw at Paris was a whole set of things going into the bottom coming out of a funnel. So rather than being a pyramid, we've got a kind of funnel model now. So we had um, nationally determined contributions, we had what's called the, the NASCAR platform, the non-state contributions agenda, now something like, I looked it up at the weekend, it's something like 11 and a half thousand different commitments from businesses, local governments and so on to take action on climate change. And different kinds of forms of climate finance but directly from the regime, but also from the development organisations, from the private <coughs> sector, going into making up the climate agreement. So it's not that a climate agreement is made and then radiated out, but lots of pieces are put into the top in order to create what was possible to agree in Paris. And this inversion, if you like, is one of the reasons why it feels like the world has changed. Well, it, it kind of has. We sort of turned ourselves a bit upside down. <coughs> 
The reasons for this are, as we know, that the world tends not to stay still in quarter of a century. So we've had shifting <coughs> what we mean by common but differentiated responsibilities. In 1990, 1991, 92, it was quite easy to draw a line between the north and the south. That line has become much more fuzzy. And so who is which side of that line? becomes much more difficult to negotiate. We've had an increasing recognition that climate change is not just a mitigation problem, although you'll forgive me, that's my area of work, and so you'll hear most about mitigation in this talk, but an increasing emphasis on the multiplicity of climate problems, uh, loss and damage, adaptation, vulnerability, an increasing number of different sites, the private sector, the urban sector, of course, very close to my own heart, and thinking about forests or thinking about the Arctic and different kinds of sites of climate governance. Climate financing has, of course, been central to how the whole Paris uh, Agreement has come through as well. And those of you who follow the IPCC will see that they too have been changing their position over the last five years, shifting from a sense that the IPCC should be providing the science that goes into the bottom of the climate agreement. Uh, sorry, into the top of the climate agreement, instead saying that the science should be at the bottom of the climate agreement, understanding what solutions are required. And the new director of the IPCC says it will only retain its relevance if it becomes more solutions oriented. So not about the basic science, but about the outcomes. So in, in these different ways, I'm trying to argue that we've had a kind of inversion of the way in which climate governance is. It would be great if this had happened because the academic community had said that this was what would happen, because then we'd have a fantastic rep impact case study. <laughs> Look at my colleague Peter over there. Uh, but unfortunately not. Uh, unfortunately, this didn't happen because the community of scholars who work on global environmental governance has been saying this is the direction of change for the last 10 years. But indeed, uh, so we as a collective have been saying so. There's been a challenge within this literature to the notion of a rational policy arena that much of the international regime architecture literature depends on. There's been a question about whether the international regime is really the key sphere for decision making around climate change. And there's been a problematization of this separation of spheres, global, national, local, public, private, state, non-state, all of these kind of boundaries with which the initial architecture of climate governance in the 1990s was created, all those assumptions have come under question in the last 10 to 15 years. And in a sense, that what we can see at Paris is that those questions, it's a bit of a pragmatic response to kind of trying to work through what's, what it means that these things about the international regime are not true anymore. So, can we govern the climate? Well, what I'm suggesting is that the evidence suggests that the Commons model has not been very successful. It suggests that from the literature, but also it suggests it because the commons model itself is giving way to this new inversion of a sense that rather than governing the commons collectively, we govern it separately and then collect what we've done. I think the challenge, as I say at the bottom of the slide here, is that even though it's giving way, it remains rather dominant. So as new actors are emerging who are involved significantly in governing the climate. They're being enrolled into the architecture of the commons model. So you have cities, for example, making targets and timetables and declarations and becoming, uh, if you like, scrutinized through the UNF <coughs> process. Uh, there's a big campaign on at the moment among cities organizations to have an IPCC for cities. Um, they seem to be trying to adopt a lot of the kind of ways of working and ways of governing climate change that have been central <coughs> to the um, commons model for the last 20 years as a means of gaining legitimacy and authority. But my argument is that if we use these kind of old ideas and old ways of trying to understand climate governance, we may find ourselves back here again with the cat asking again which way should we go in another 25 years time. And so I want to now walk you through some other ways of thinking about climate change as a problem, which might lead us to some different kinds of solutions. I'm going to read a little bit of this out. 
think possibly my favourite um, recent climate change politics. The stampede to buy powerful vacuum cleaners intensified yesterday as retailers reported a fourfold surge in sales. Shoppers made their feelings clear about an EU ban on models of more than 1,600 watts by visiting stores or online sellers in their droves. Many have been stockpiling two or more high power models to beat regulations that came into effect yesterday. The new EU directive is intended to reduce energy use, but it has infuriated the public who say they'll have to spend longer using the appliances. James Dyson has suggested that Britain should leave the EU over a dispute about vacuum cleaners. <laughs> I mean, I know I have arguments about cleaning my house with my partner, but I'm not going to leave the EU over my vacuum cleaner. Um, a new law, etc., etc. Dyson was not affected by the changes as none of his vacuum cleaners are rated above 1,400 watts. However, the company's founder claims that legislation is too crude and does not go far enough. So, two extremely entertaining articles, especially if you read full versions of them from the Daily Mail and Telegraph about the politics of climate change as found in the vacuum cleaner. Vacuum cleaner legislation, which was brought in in uh, the autumn or late summer of 2014, the idea was to reduce uh, energy used in appliances. We have many energy efficiency standards in appliances now as a form of energy and climate governance. But this was too much for the Daily Mail and their concern about British housewives being coming to, there were some nice pictures of British housewives hoovering in this article, um, and all for James Dyson, an idea that technological innovation is here, not going far enough. So what I want to try to tell you here is that we're looking, in some senses, for climate politics in the wrong places. It's not many of us who study vacuum cleaner politics uh, yet, although I'm expecting quite a few dissertations on it after today's lecture. Um, but, this is a site of climate politics, and quite a controversial one, it turns out. And what it epitomizes for me is this shift from thinking about the climate problem as a pollution problem of our common atmosphere, to thinking about instead climate change, and in this case particularly decarbonisation, as a systemic problem about how do we change the socio-technical system through which our society is configured. You could also make the argument about resilience, I think, but here uh, that resilience is another form of systemic problem rather than it being a, a hazard or risk problem. So we've moved from a sort of hazard or risk of climate change to resilience as a kind of figuration of it as a systemic problem. And I think the same is true from mitigation and kind of to decarbonisation. This means that we have to start then looking at the politics of climate change in some different places. And climate change is now about decarbonising the systems of which we're a part. And that means, of course, low carbon energy systems, but it also means systems of consumption and production. So we might start to ask ourselves, you know, which is, which is my low carbon cup of coffee? Today I had a, a, a black cup of coffee, but my favourite cup of coffee is actually a latte, which turns, uh, turns out to be not really very good for the climate, it's the biggest uh, footprint here. Because it is the milk in the coffee that is the most highly intensive, intensive carbon production. There's not much in the United Nations Framework Convention about how I should be drinking my coffee, but we're thinking here that that <coughs> emerging sites of governance are being thought about. Somebody has gone to the trouble of carbon footprinting my latte. We have some new tools and new ideas to start help us think about this side of decarbonisation. And I think that they are opening up this agenda for us in ways that are helpful. I'm going to try and push the argument a little bit further about the things that I think they're missing in a minute. But just to say where those kind of debates are. So on the one hand, the global governance debate has told us that we need to kind of look at this multi-sided geography, the multiple actors, institutions, interventions that are happening around climate change. Governance is multiple and fragmented, and there are multiple different forms of power that are also in operation. It's a largely social, uh, it's a largely institutional approach which figures that social agency is prime in how we understand change. Transition studies are a little bit like uh, you know, bringing coals to Newcastle, talking about transition studies in Sussex, uh, but 
here we think about decarbonisation as a governance which happens through uh, existing regimes and the sorts of niches and experiments which emerge within that. There's been a kind of question about whether there is enough of a sense of politics within that literature. But governing is here considered in a more socio-material way. So social agency is not only prime, but it's also of material agency that we need to take into account. So these perspectives, I think, are starting to grapple with and give us some of the tools to start thinking about the problem of climate change differently as a problem of decarbonisation. And it's telling us that there is both a new geography and a new politics to climate change. So decarbonisation spills out across the social realm. We shouldn't be expecting to find all of climate politics happening in a summit at the end of every year. We should be expecting to find climate politics in all sorts of different places. These political spaces, though, are fragmented, opportunistic, and often experimental. And some of you will know that I've been writing quite a lot about experimentation in the city, and I'm not actually going to talk very much about that today, but we could come back to that in some questions. But it's also newly political, because there are multiple different kinds of actors who become important. It turns out then that dairy farmers are quite important to us understanding uh, how to address climate change. So, so to steel workers and vacuum manufacturers. None of them have traditionally had much of a seat at the table in terms of shaping the politics of climate change, with the possible exception of the steel industry. But it also means that the climate regime, whatever its eventual size and shape, cannot possibly hope to contain or control or command all of the sites of climate governance. <coughs> and from my perspective, that's actually quite a hopeful message because it means that there's much more that many of us can be doing and many other actors can be doing. I want to talk to you about that. I think for us to get into those sites, to understand that new geography and that new politics, we need to start working with some different kind of concepts of power and agency. That our existing concepts of power and agency, which tend to locate it with particular actors, fail to really allow us to see how it's produced relationally between those sites and those actors. So rather than thinking that power has shifted from the United Nations Framework Convention to these other actors, I want to talk about how it's relationally produced between actors in this system, which involves the United Nations framework. So the framework convention is still important, and so is what happens at Paris. The tendency for decarbonisation to get everywhere is not surprising if you think of power as created in relation between things. It's actually, from a, a sort of a post-structural or a Foucauldian perspective, the fact that we find climate change in so many different places from the Framework Convention through to your cup of latte is actually a success of its power. Its ability to mobilize and circulate and become attached to other things shows that it's a successful politics. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now. So in summary for me then, this is not governing as command and control, but it's governing instead about how do we shape socio-technical assemblages so that, they can, so that we conduct ourselves in different ways. So governing is done through the arrangement and management of people and objects, producing the material conditions that make particular ways of being comprehensible and possible. The pictures are from Tesco's, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about Tesco's in a minute, but one of the things that made low carbon comprehensible and possible at Tesco's was a door on a fridge. And many of you will have doors on your own fridges at home. I'm guessing that pretty much all of you have a fridge and that all of them have a door on them. All right? Okay, but supermarkets don't do that. They have fridges, but they don't have doors on them. Because they think that people won't open the doors on the fridges to take things out. Even though we know that at home we do open the doors on our fridges to take things out of fridges. What Tesco's tried to do was to think differently about what the fridge was, what its role was, and how to kind of engage customers with the fridge. Um, through carbon labeling its own operations in stores and carbon labeling its own products. And I'll say a bit more about that case study in a minute, but just in case you were wondering why 
There were some fridges in this picture, or I'd like to explain it. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that what becomes important when we think about climate politics is how do we actually accomplish governance in the sites and the spaces and the places where we need to govern the carbon. So for me, it's a bit like, you know, if you, need, if you wanted to ride a bike, you would first need to find the bike and then you would ride it. And with the governing climate change, we've been trying to kind of ride the bike a bit before we actually know where the decisions are and where the carbon is. Yes, those international organizations and processes are important, but it turns out that how carbon is integrated into our society is through things like laws on fridges. And it's those sorts of sites that we need to use as a means of accomplishing climate governance. Some of you might be familiar with um, Timothy Mitchell's book on uh, carbon democracy. And I find it very useful as a means of thinking about how carbon and low carbon configurations are produced. So what I'm trying to say here is not that all forms of assemblage are equally important. They are determined, they are created <coughs> in particular ways. For Mitchell, it was an apparatus of calculation that brought elements from other projects together in order to create the electricity network. So this is a designed, intentional, calculated process. So from my perspective, tracing how climate governance works requires working through how different entities are brought together and made to matter in relationship to climate change. And that then allows us to think about how do we accomplish it, where do we achieve it. So in a recent book which I've written called Accomplishing Climate Governance, um, I look at these four different processes of authorising, ordering, articulating and making things public as the kinds of dynamics that are important in how climate governance is achieved on the ground. And today I'm just going to talk about two, the ordering and the making public. And I'm going to say a little bit about its politics and its geographies as I go through. A slight aside, which I would be very happy to come back to in questions, is that what does this mean for the way in which we do our research? Because so much climate governance research is based on going to conferences with the parties or interviewing particular organisations. And if we think of climate governance as different, then I might say that we have to do our research differently as well. But I'm just going to leave that for now. But to say that, I do think this has quite profound methodological implications for us as social scientists. Okay, so I want to talk about this idea of how do you govern climate when it is everywhere. So if you're following what I'm saying, I'm trying to make the argument that what matters is how we decarbonize the systems which produce carbon in our society, and that this involves everything from drinking a cup of coffee to driving a car to switching on your lights and so on and so forth. So that then might seem like a rather hard task because climate change is then everywhere, how do you start, how is it possible to get any sense of traction on that? And one of the important things then about how climate is being accomplished or how climate governance is being accomplished is how things are made to come into order and be uh, created as objects which can be governed in relation to climate change. And authority is a very important process of that, science is very important in that process of authorization. But so too is particularly making things work in alignment with one another. How come it is that we tend to think of, for example, homes and houses and energy use as related to climate change, whereas it's only very much more recently that we've thought of food consumption as related to climate change. So particular objects and particular sites have become ordered in relation to climate change and others have yet to be ordered in relation to climate change. It's still quite controversial to think about diet as a climate change site versus thinking about home energy efficiency, which is quite commonplace now. So certain things are ordered in relation to climate change and others aren't. So from the kind of post-structuralist perspective that I'm using here, governing is usually thought of as a problematizing activity. Something comes to be seen to be a problem in relationship, in this case, to climate change. So, how we heat our homes, or how we drive our cars, or whether we have meat in our diet, is problematized as an activity that requires a form of intervention. If it's not a problem, we tend not to intervene. 
But this requires ongoing work to keep the climate problem coherent and legible. It's okay to say, you know, housing is a problem, we need to govern housing in relationship to climate change, but that requires ongoing work to say housing is a site for climate governance. You can't just kind of say it once and then leave it. And this work, because it's a practice, is also always open to contestation. Saying, well, actually, no, housing isn't as important as me. Actually, or automobility, or to the steel industry. We should be changing our site. So there's always reconfiguration, reversal, and contestation present. It's a struggle to problematize and act on climate change. And critical here have been techniques of calculation. Carbon footprinting, different forms of, of accounting for greenhouse gas emissions, the carbon disclosure project some of you might be familiar with, all sorts of forms of calculating carbon's worth and letting those calculations hold particular orders or configurations in place. But what I've found very striking from the work that I did, and the, the book is based on a series of small case studies that I did over a period of a decade in the UK, including both corporate case studies and case studies of particular community energy projects. Um, there's one city in it, but I, I tried to leave the city alone for a little bit, <laughs> a bit in the book. Um, but what I found intriguing about that is that most of what was happening was not a diagnosis of a problem, but a diagnosis of a possibility. And it was calculations about the possibilities of climate change that were shaping the extent to which it was being accomplished. So while in our, the literature tends to tell us that governing is a problematizing <laughs> activity, my reading of what's happening and where climate is being governed is because it's diagnosed as a possibility. And in some work that I've been doing recently with Matthew Patterson and Johannes Strippel, we've been thinking about the cultural politics of climate change and the ways in which making climate change compelling and desirable is also been central to how that's been achieved. So for Tesco, a revolution in green consumption is a fantastic opportunity. Once and for all to break the link between consumption and emissions, and in doing so to satisfy new consumer need and grow our business. So this is not climate change as a problem. This is climate change as something that's compelling, desirable, and possible. And it has all sorts of potentially negative connotations. I'm not trying to say that this means that, you know, uh, we're all safe or anything. But what I'm trying to say is that how it is accomplished, how it is actually done, requires this diagnosis of possibility. So these te techniques of calculation at Tesco's were used not to kind of think about carbon as a problem, but to think instead of it as a possibility. Tesco's uh, had these goals, and it's still, these. These goals have receded somewhat with the changing economic fortunes of Tesco's and also with the changing uh, leadership of the organization. But they still remain their corporate goals. And it's this idea that as an organization, they were driven by data and measurability and targets. And that calculation of carbon just fitted in with their kind of mantra of every little bit helps, which is their slogan. One of the most intriguing parts of an interview that I did with Tesco's is where they told me that carbon was a more useful form of calculation to them than money. Because money had this horrible habit of changing its value in relation to, to things like inflation and exchange rates. But carbon was always the same. You could rely on carbon. So they were able to calculate and see through their business. It made it legible to them to think about where they should manage the business. So bringing climate change to order is about making it comprehensible. Can we comprehend climate change sufficiently in order to govern it? And I've tried to suggest here that this is not about seeing it only as a problem, but as a diagnosis of possibility, and that calculation is central to that, to so making it legible to be able to understand. But I also want to make an argument here that it's also about making climate change sensible or our sensibility to it. And this is a little bit about the desirability of, of climate change as well. So for something to be sensible, it's the faculty of feeling, capacity of sensation and emotion, as distinguished from cognition. 
And much of the work on the kind of calculation of climate change and the sort of governmentality of it, if you like, focuses very strongly on how you can make it legible and calculable. It has much less to say about how and why climate change comes to matter to be your sensibility to us, something that we care about. And I was really struck by this in interviewing a series of people who had experienced a program uh, run by HSBC, the bank, in, uh, as was with, who had engaged more than 40,000 of their staff in something called the Climate Champions Program globally, where staff were recruited to go on a two-week um, some of, some of them would have called it a holiday, some of them would have called it an ordeal, <laughs> so somewhere in between, to uh, engage in being citizen scientists, working alongside some science organisations. The programme that they went on focused on them bearing witness to climate change in their valued environments, and using that experience to design and develop a programme that they would then implement in their own organisation. For, for all of the partners involved in this HSBC climate partnership, it was about making climate change have some form of meaning and sensibility to the organisation that mattered, rather than calculating it in terms of making it legible, it was making it connected. And I think we see that also in other sites. Many of you will, will know of community energy projects or community food growing projects or other sorts of grassroots projects where this kind of idea of a sensibility of climate change is, is central to the way in which they're able to be affected. So I hope that I've managed to persuade you that ordering, comprehending climate change is central to how it's accomplished and that is about both making it legible but also making it have this sensibility. Alongside this process of ordering climate change is what we can think of as making climate change public. This might seem a very strange thing to talk to you about because obviously climate change is already public, we all know about it, it's not secret, it's not private, and there are lots of publics engaged with climate change in various different ways. But I want to pay particular attention to how specific communities of practice or specific publics are created around different kinds of orders of climate change. I'd like to be able to tell you that my inspiration for this came from reading Bruno Latour, but actually my inspiration came from reading the children's series, How to Train Your Dragon. Uh, if, if those of you who have not yet uh, been exposed to reading the series, How to Train Your Dragon, I can highly recommend it. Uh, but in one uh, book here, uh, How to Twist the Dragon's Tail, I think it's, uh, it's maybe number five out of the series of 12, but I can't quite remember. The, opening scene is of uh, Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III, the unlikely hero of this uh, series of books, um, being taken to something called The Thing. And I was like, okay. And it is, an, uh, it is the Nordic assembly of the different tribes that come together to negotiate rather than fight with each other <laughs> over particular sets of decisions. But it is called The Thing, and it is a public assembly. And this is where the word thing and assembly come together. And indeed, this is a picture, uh, a photograph taken of an arena, an actual environment that was used as a, a location for Nordic things. So this is where public assemblies used to, to take place. Now, why this sort of fascination with the idea of the thing? I have to say that my daughter, who I was reading it to, didn't like the idea that I was getting out my notebook to make a few notes or just reading a bedtime story, so I had to put it down and do it again <coughs> later. But here, as Latour, of course, picks up in his own work, and did so, I think, without having to read the children's novel, um, he argues that this association between things and publics is critical to how we understand the formation of a public. That publics do not just form by themselves through social relations, but they form through relationships with things. Procedures to authorize and legitimize are important, but it's only half of what it is needed to assemble. The other half lies in the matters that matter, the res that creates the public, the re, -re public. The res is the is the is the the thing. 
And for Anders Bloch, a sociologist at University of Copenhagen, he argues that what we're seeing now is that new climatic constellations create these hybrid problem-solving assemblies. So the climatic constellation might be new bicycling routes and lanes and the ability to Copenhagenize your city in, in Copenhagen. <coughs> Now this work in general in the, on material publics, as it's called, has focused very much on matters of controversy. So Sarah Watmore, for example, suggests that these matters of concern that create the formation of publics are ontological disturbances where the things on which people rely become molten. One of the case studies that I looked at was a, a small hydropower scheme in Hexham, in the north of England, uh, funded by the unlikely constellation of Hugh Fernley Whittingstall and British Gas uh, through something called the Energy Share Competition, that some of you might be familiar with. Hexham won the money to design and develop their hydropower station. But in the end, the project became undone, not because of contestation over climate change, but contestation over the fish in the Salmon River in which it was going to be inserted. From the angling community, there was this idea that the fish mincing machine, as they like to call it, uh, was not welcome in their river. And their, the protest and the conflict became about, you know, whose river was it? Was it a river for energy or a river for fish? But the materiality of the fish, the fishing industry, and the, and the, the particular breeding cycles of salmon oil in that river mattered significantly. They became the matters of concern around which a public contesting climate change emerged. And this is a, 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 some, an article from the local press and also some of the campaigning material that was used in the, in the, in the example. So this is partly here to say that accomplishing climate governance is always contested and always open to these different kinds of public formations around it. And it's to say that these matters of concern do matter when we're making climate publics and indeed opposing them. But one of the very striking things about the work that I did was that the times that climate change is controversial are actually rather few and far between. The amount of objection to acting on climate change is relatively limited. This politics of consensus, some of you might know the geographer Eric Swingerdahl at uh, Manchester University, has argued it's post-political, it's the technical, it, it's making politics technical that has allowed it to become uncontroversial. I can see some of the argument there, and it's definitely worth exploring. But one of the things that my research suggests instead is that one of the reasons why climate, is, climate change lacks controversy is because the matters of concern are not only about controversy, but they're matters of care. They are things around which people form publics because they form relationships of care and solidarity around. And that, that is also a means through which publics are formed. It's not only have to be controversial to be public. You can be public because you have a form of solidarity. And those are things that we also see in the climate change. I'll just briefly uh, illustrate that with the case of the low carbon zone in Brixton, which initially found it very hard to communicate the idea of a low carbon zone, a scheme uh, implemented by Boris Johnson to get areas of London to reduce their emissions in line with a 20.12% target for the 2012 Olympics, um, but found themselves able to create a whole set of relationships and forms of care and solidarity over different sorts of practices such as food growing, insulation, and then uh, solar energy. So from a rather calculated start, it was the making of a climate public around Brixton that was able to come together over different kinds of interventions in the borough that made this work. So if you sat down and thought about these things on a very basic level, nobody would ever do anything because it would be too much of a risk. 
but the idea of making a community around it gathered the momentum, created the, um, the will, if you like, to improve this particular community in relation to climate change. So can we govern the climate? What I hope that I've been able to persuade you of is that, in a sense, the time for heroic climate solutions, which go from summit to summit, dealing with a contained issue we call climate change, is probably over. And that we can't govern the climate in that way. And if we continue to try to do that for the next 25 years, then I think I'm still probably just about being sufficiently employed to come back and tell you again that we can't do it. But instead that what we are, like, uh, like uh, Hiccup himself actually, we are instead on a kind of continual quest for what I would call a resolution to climate change rather than its solution. So we're continually resolving ourselves in relation to climate change. We continually improve, relate, create new ways of thinking climate change. But we are not solving a single silver bullet sort of problem. That kind of heroic climate summit <laughs> governance requires a very clearly demarcated problem, and we just don't have that anymore in terms of climate change. So what I want to suggest is that rather than thinking of climate change as a problem that requires solution, we need instead to think with Foucault about climate as a condition of the population. Like inequality or a lack of democracy, things over which we have worked and continue to work. We don't have perfect democracy here in this country or elsewhere, but we are more democratic. We don't have gender equality, but we have more gender equality than we used to. They're conditions of the population that we continually try to improve. <coughs> so this is a politics, I think, that emerges not in the space of the public, but of a republic, in the sense of needing to engage with the social materiality of the ways in which we in invest in our infrastructures, in our housing, in our uh, food systems, and so on and so forth. For me, it actually opens up a huge array of politics for us, and it is quite, I find it quite exciting and quite um, invigorating to think of politics in these terms, because I think of it as things that we can then do, multiple things that we, we're not then relying on a very few actors. It's also, of course, rather daunting in terms of the number of different kinds of sites of politics. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that we don't have, if you like, a map to a particular place. We don't have a path where we can say, okay, this road and not that road. But instead, what we have is a compass to help us try and orientate ourselves around decarbonisation and to continually make better decisions to, to address climate change. So I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you.